final section of our conference with Professor Kaidan. Kaidan is correct, right? Kaidan Hazard from Rice University. Kaidan, please. All right, so uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for sticking around to the very last minute. Um, I've had a lot of fun at the conference so far. Um, Unfortunately, I will not be telling you too much about machine learning. I don't actually have any real machine learning results in the talk. I am going to pretty explicitly highlight three points in the talk where I think it would be very exciting to apply machine learning methods. So if anybody just doesn't have enough to work on and you want new problems, come talk to me. Um, but, but there are things where we've tried some simple things, the simple things don't work, and having some more sophisticated tools that I think machine learning pr could provide would be really interesting. And so if you don't do it, we might move in that direction. But my talk today is basically going to be about some of the new frontiers in quantum simulation that my group is interested in. Um, I had fantastic introduction, especially this morning by um, Johannes, uh, to some of these in terms of quantum gas microscopes and tweezer arrays, which are the sorts of things I'm going to be talking about. So um, I'm calling it programmable quantum matter because I feel like we're really entering a new frontier in this area of ultra-cold atoms, ultra-cold molecules, which is more or less my home field where we are getting the ability not just to tune one parameter, two parameter, but control a lot of parameters, even get fully universal quantum control on these systems. And so when I say programmable quantum matter, that's what I mean. Um, it's uh, easier for me to program because I'm a theorist and I just tell my experimental colleagues they should do it and occasionally they listen. And, uh, but of course, it's still a great deal of technical work for them. The outline of my talk, it's an ambitious outline, is to tell you about um, two types of very different types of programmability, or really maybe even three different types of programmability, um, building from a very simple new direction, which is just a new tuning knob in these ultra-cold systems, something called SUN symmetry in uh, fermionic systems, and that was actually mentioned in the last talk briefly. Uh, then thinking about how to actually do these programmable arrays that we've heard about, but not with Rydberg atoms, which is what I think everyone else in the uh, conference has talked about, but instead actually bringing the traps close enough to tunnel couple the different fermions. So you can tunnel from one trap to another. That's extremely technically challenging, but has some very big payoffs I want to tell you about, and has now been demonstrated experiment, uh, experimentally for fermions uh, by Wasim Backer, building on work by Salim Yochim and uh, Adam Kaufman, Cindy Regal. And then I will tell you about a very different type of programmability. This is sort of programmability in real space where you can lay out traps however you want. I'm going to tell you about uh, what are called synthetic dimensions. And this is a type of programmability in the internal states of atoms or molecules. And I will try to convince you that more than just a big buzzword, because it's now in hundreds of papers that people talk about these synthetic dimensions, it's actually a useful and interesting concept. Um, Okay, my group does other things, but I'm not going to tell you about those. So the um, first direction is these programmable fermions. So I'm going to start with a little bit of programmability and work my way outward. Also, I want to say I encourage you at any point, just interrupt me and stop me. You know, if I don't tell you at all about the last topic, it's not going to break my heart. I'd rather just um, get things clear and have a discussion with you. So feel free. We can talk about anything. The, white, the blackboard looks really nice, and I haven't had a chance to use it. So, um, all right. So... A little bit of programmability. What do I mean? We can program the lattice depth in an optical lattice, which we've heard about. And that lets us uh, program, or we'd usually just say tune, the interaction to kinetic energy ratio. And you can also do things like change the lattice filling. I can, on average, have one particle per site, two particles per site, half a particle per site. Um, another tuning knob that we have in cold atoms that is especially difficult uh, to tune in, say, a condensed matter system is the spin. So I can have a spin half or a spin one system. I can even have spin one fermions. There's no um, spin statistics for these non-relativistic uh, systems to worry about. And so these are nice control knobs that the community has had for a long time, and there's been a ton of progress um, working with these control knobs. So in the context of some things we've heard about in this conference, people have realized periodic uh, potentials of light uh, that the atoms feel, um, and these periodic potentials, optical lattices, allow you to explore this Hubbard model physics. So the Hubbard model, I think you've all heard about it many times already at the conference, but just atoms moving around in a lattice. If two atoms get on the same lattice site, there's an interaction penalty. 
And this is from a review by Annabelle Bort and uh, company where they've overviewed all of the cold atom experiments, or at least the one and two dimensional cold atoms experiments um, as a function of temperature and doping and sort of connecting the temperatures we're at to some of the interesting well-known phase diagram where there's an antiferromagnet and then maybe some exotic stuff happening, although it's not so clear and nobody knows what the phase diagram of this model actually is at low temperatures. Um, and one thing you'll notice immediately is that we're actually still pretty warm. All of these uh, temperatures are actually well above the transition temperatures. So that's a little bit of a depressing message, but it turns out there's already very rich sort of quantum simulation targets, interesting physics in this high temperature regime, and there are ways to get colder, hopefully, although you can see the field's been struggling to do this for a while. There, um, I wanna show you one way we're managing to get colder by exploiting a little bit of extra programmability and hopefully see some new physics. Okay, so the, new the first new type of programmability I wanna tell you about is going from the ordinary Hubbard model, which is for spin one half particles, spin up and spin down, to the SUN Hubbard model, where you have many different flavors of, uh, of fermions, and instead of spin up and spin down, I'll call them red, green, blue, so they're colors, flavors, something like this. And remarkably, this has been studied for 40 years in the condensed matter community just because it's a really interesting model, has uh, uh, exotic ground states. It turns out the SUN symmetry actually stabilizes quantum fluctuations. You normally think about a large spin as becoming classical, but for SUN Hubbard models, it doesn't. The symmetry enhances and preserves the quantum fluctuations, and I'm happy to tell you how that works. But the reason that it sort of has uh, reinvigorated interest recently is because there are atomic systems, the alkaline earth atoms, which come from the second column of the periodic table or have a similar electronic structure, so things like strontium, which we heard about this morning, or ytterbium, they actually realize this SUN symmetry to an astonishingly high degree. So maybe one part in a billion optimistically, but at least one part in a thousand, one part in a million. So this is not just kind of a crude symmetry like we often use in modeling real materials. This is a very precise symmetry that's enforced by the laws of atomic physics. And so now we have this interesting model. It's realized in cold atoms experiments, and we're really excited to study this model. And I want to give you a little bit more motivation than just existing cold atoms experiments. And so to understand this, I really want to go back to why do we want to quantum simulate a Hubbard model at all? What is the point? So the point is that we don't actually know how to solve these on a classical computer, so we want to quantum simulate them. We get insights into materials. We can see new phases of matter regardless of whether they're in a material or not. We might want to play with those as physicists. We're always interested in the sort of novel things. And if you're very interested in sort of quantum computing or foundational ideas, maybe you don't care anything about materials or new phases of matter. You just want something where a qu controllable quantum system goes beyond a classical computer. And this could provide an avenue to getting there. But there are challenges in all of these. Um, and this is, in the case of the usual Hubbard model we study in cold atoms, the ordinary SU2 Hubbard model is actually extremely pathological. So even though the community has invested so much effort in it, it's an incredibly fine-tuned point that has properties that are almost certainly not representative of Hubbard models in general or real materials. So for example, at half filling, where you have this Mott transition, you also have perfect nesting of the Fermi surface. This is a big coincidence. There's no reason for this happen together. There's a Van Hove singularity there. These things should not just happen at the same point generically, so this leads to some pathological phenomena. So it's an interesting point, but maybe you don't want to concentrate exclusively on it. The other thing I showed you, the temperatures are still too high for a lot of the things we'd like to study. And lastly, simulation methods are too good. Even though we can't fully solve the model, at least in this higher temperature regime, uh, we, we can solve the model. And even the ground state, we're starting to learn a lot about thanks to tensor network methods, thanks to um, you know, sophisticated quantum Monte Carlo methods, and now beginning to see this with neural quantum states. And so the reason I'm setting this up, these grand challenges in simulating uh, quantum simulation of Hubbard models, is because SUN actually addresses all of these challenges. So for one thing, by changing in, you break this kind of pathological property that the Mott condition, that integer filling, coincides with perfect nesting. So that only happens for n equal two, and it doesn't happen for any other n. Um, the temperature, as I'm going to show you, has been stuck above about 0.2 times the tunneling rate 
for all of the SU2 experiments. And I will show you shortly that in fact you can get much colder. And sorry, I changed from T over T to T over J here. Oh no, here it is. The temperature is about 0.1 for SUN, and this is due to an intrinsic cooling effect that as you make N larger, your systems get colder when you fix the entropy. And so we're actually setting world record cold temperatures, and the other thing is these SUN algorithm, uh, these SUN systems really challenge our numerical algorithms. So standard techniques like determinantal quantum Monte Carlo, tensor networks, exact diagonalization, numerical link cluster expansion, uh, all of these things you may have heard of, they actually are just immensely worse for SUN. And each of them is worse for a different reason. There's like a conservation of evil at play here where um, you know, every algorithm breaks for different reasons for the same problem. Um, and so if you're worried that the SU2 is too easy of a problem for your algorithms, then the SUN Hubbard model is where you should really be going. So if you want to do quantum simulation beyond the reach of classical computers, this is a great place to go. And so experiments are now about a factor of 10 colder than can be simulated using any known classical algorithms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't. So this is a very, very interesting question. So is there a large end limit where things become controlled and tractable? The answer is there is a large end limit. But to take the large end limit properly where you get control on the field theory that emerges, you have to fix the representation of the SUN group. Um, and so you take into infinity and a fixed representation. And what this means is that the number of atoms per site has to grow proportional to n. So you end up studying you know, models where you have uh, n over three particles per site and take n to infinity. Whereas the natural physical limit and what's relevant, more relevant to the experiments is fixing one particle per site or something like that and taking n to infinity. And that limit does not have a controlled large n limit. So there are very, very interesting analytic calculations. Back in the 1980s, uh, Affleck, uh, what, uh, uh, Reed, such to have all, who, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm forgetting lots of people, but already back then they were um, starting to think about um, using the large n limit as a controlled analytic tool to understand ground states. But it is special contrived or different large n limits than are relevant to this. Yeah, Tiago. Um, right, so the, the point is that you still have the same band structure for each flavor, but your chemical potential shifts down at a fixed density. So if you're at one particle per site, the chemical potential moves away from that Van Hove singularity. That's really what's going on there. Cool. Any other questions? We may not make it past SUN today. I like it. Um, so, um, so, anyways, these are reasons. Uh, Christoph. Yeah. yeah, this is also the picture of the nesting, if this helps anyone. But the, yeah, good. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. All right. Did it answer your question? <laughs> okay, good. If you change your mind and want to ask, just come back. Uh, but this is a picture of the different fer the Fermi surface for the different n, and you can see the n equal two is very special. You have this diamond, and as you increase n while fixing the density, the Fermi surface changes away from this diamond, becomes a little sphere in the center, or a circle in the center. Okay, and so just to emphasize this point about the temperature, if you put it on the same phase diagram from this kind of review article, uh, the temperature that we're getting in these SUN systems would be down here. Of course, the phase diagram is different for the SUN systems, so it's a little apples to oranges comparison, but at least there it is. So this is some experimental data from a collaborate, well, from Yoshiro Takahashi's group. Um, we collaborated with them to compare some calculations with it. And there's a lot of data on here. Don't worry too much about all of it. Let me just suggest you look at the, um, the blue points are the experimental data. The vertical axis is uh, singlet triplet imbalance. It doesn't matter really what that is. It's a measure of the nearest neighbor correlations in the system, spin correlations in the system. And this is plotted as a function of the entropy per particle and a harmonically trapped gas. And of course, as the entropy per particle goes down, you get increasingly large correlations for the SU2 system. Now, when you go from SU2, and this happens to be 1D, but they have results for 1D, 2D, 3D. So you do these results for SU2, 1D, 
and then you go to SU61D, uh, which is this green data, you see the correlations are immensely increased. And this is not like an artifact of the way we're defining the correlations. If you just took a non-interactor or, or uh, sort of fix the amount of, put everything in singlets or something, nearest neighbor singlets, you would, uh, these would have the same value. So you're really getting larger correlations by going from SU2 to SU6. Um, and there's an interesting story behind this. We understand very well why this happens, but it's connected to the fact that you're getting much colder in these systems. And whether or not you're getting longer range correlations, there's not direct experimental evidence for, but in theory it predicts your correlation length is in fact increasing with this. So, um, so the curves here for the blue and green, we have nice results that more or less match the experiments, not perfectly, but there's absolutely no fitting being done here. This is a purely sort of quote ab initio calculation. Um, we're able to do that because those are 1D results. Actually, we do that just with exact diagonalization. Um, the errors are a combination of theory and experimental error bars, and so those are good enough for our purposes. You could do DMRG if you really wanted. In fact, we've done that at zero temperature. But since it's finite temperature, you know, it gets a little more challenging to use DMRG. So we just did the exact diagonalization. So I, I don't show you the results here, I guess, or maybe I do on this build here. Thought I, okay, I forgot to put it in. Um, we, there are also results that look very similar in 3D. Um, so actually the experiment, oh, it's, it, it's on the slide, I put it on here. So the experimental 3D results are here, these red data points. And we developed an SUN quantum Monte Carlo code, determinantal quantum Monte Carlo code with Richard Scalatar to um, try to compute that data. And what you see is that um, that's actually this dashed line. And we cannot get below an entropy per particle of about 2.5 kb. So, so the experiments are a factor of, um, you know, maybe not quite a factor of two colder in terms of entropy. If you translate this into temperature, it might be as much as a factor of 10 in temperature that the experiments are beating our best simulations with this quantum Monte Carlo. Um, we've also tried methods like numerical linked cluster expansions and they do not improve the situation. Uh, recently, Evgeny Kozik has developed a diagrammatic quantum Monte Carlo, but it would uh, totally be inapplicable for the interaction strength that's used here, which is about 15. So um, this, this, I think, is very interesting. It's some data where we are well beyond the ability of our numerical tools to simulate. And it's also very interesting physics that I won't tell you about, but our group is spending a lot of time trying to understand what is the physics. So what is the um, equation of state? We had a nice collaboration with Simon Fulling and Emmanuel Bloch where they measured it and we applied our techniques and had some nice agreement. We've been trying to understand deeply the phase diagram starting with SU3 because even this, even the zero temperature phase diagram, just like for SU2 is unknown, but the situation's even much worse for SU3 Hubbard models. There's been a lot of good work in the Heisenberg limit, large U, but we're trying to understand the Hubbard limit. And then with uh, Henning Schlimmer, a, a graduate student who visited us from Fabian Grush and Annabelle Bortz group, um, we were able to actually start doping these Hubbard models at a hole and ask what happens to the hole. And we've heard earlier in the conference that a hole in a Hubbard model can partially dissociate, that it can turn into a spin-on and a charge-on. Not They don't fully fractionalize in the SU2 Hubbard model, but they start to move apart by a few sites. And I will just say that something similar happens for SU3, but the structure of that charge on hole on pair is totally changed. And so we've understood that using this uh, geometric string theory that they've kind of pioneered and uh, combining it with some tensor uh, network results. So I'm happy to tell you more about that. So I think this is actually an extremely interesting machine learning target from the viewpoint of these uh, neural quantum states. It's challenging for neural quantum states. We're talking about 2D or 3D models, finite temperature. But on the other hand, it's a case where our current methods are just totally inapplicable. You know, so I'm showing you this graph here, and there's just no theory curve down here because everything diverges. All of our error bars go through the roof because of sign problem. Same thing with numerical link cluster expansion, totally diverges. So even if you could only get 5% accuracy, you know, this is not determining a ground state where you have to get it to four or five digits where, for things to start to become interesting. If you could get this to 5% accuracy, the community would be enormously excited. So I'd be very curious to know if there's potential for some of these sophisticated wave functions that this community is using here. Um, so that's really what I want to tell you about SUN, and then I'm going to move on to a little bit more programmable 
um, were much more programmable systems, but that was our first new tuning knob, tuning it. And so I'll pause, more questions about this? Okay, then I'll keep moving forward. So, you know, one tuning knob is not enough programmability. We really wanna do things like other geometries, not just square lattices. What if we wanna do Kagome lattices or disordered lattices, dislocations, quasi-crystals, that would be great. Longer range interactions, we heard about one way of doing that today, the Rydberg dressing, but that doesn't give you full control over the long range interactions. For example, if I wanted a one over R interaction, this would be pretty hope hopeless with neutral atoms. So um, is there any way of getting this in our systems? Few body interactions, like three body, four body interactions, gains fields, this would all be great. So how can we do this? And as a starting point into this, let's just look at the geometry. Cold atoms, all of our lattices kind of look like this, or we get more sophisticated sometimes. Um, real materials look more like this, and this is not even, I think, a particularly complicated real material. This is actually a real material my group's working on for totally unrelated reasons, which has been really scary. It turns out I'm really bad at understanding crystal structures, having been dumbed down by cold atom lattices for a long time. So, um, but it would be nice to have a little bit of this complexity in the cold atom systems. And so these programmable tweezer arrays seem like a great way of doing that. We've heard that you can do that with Rydberg atoms and tweezers. So now let's just do this with our um, atoms and put the tweezers really close so the atoms can tunnel around. And that's a great idea, except it doesn't work at all if you just try to do it like this. And the issue is basically things you don't care about when you do the Rydberg atom tweezers, like if one trap is 1% deeper than another trap, this doesn't really matter for a Rydberg atom tweezer array. But it turns out these traps are so deep that a 1% uh, deviation in the trap depth would completely shut the tunneling off, because it would put an energy difference that's much larger than the tunneling rate on the system. So you have to be able to control those, um, those sort of on-site uh, potentials, meaning the tweezer depth, very accurately tweezer to tweezer. There's also, depending on how you build these systems, uh, this was actually, these are pictures from Wasim Backer's experiment in this paper. It's built by sh sending in two AOMs perpendicular to each other, and if you happen to know anything about AOM, it doesn't really matter if you don't, but you have in-control knobs on one AOM, you have in-control knobs on another, and you have in-squared traps you're trying to control. So there's just, you don't have enough parameters to tune everything. So Wasim came up with this beautiful idea of just stroboscopically flashing on rows of this tweezer, left to right, and doing it so fast that the atoms only see the time average of this. And so if you can do this fast enough, it's like a flow K thing. It turns out the atoms don't heat. We actually showed that in some theory calculations in this paper, and they measure 25 second lifetimes while doing this, so this is very, very good for the system. Uh, and then you can more or less paint whatever you want. The top are actual images of atoms. It looks disordered, but that's deceiving. That's just because to image this, they're taking the tweezers, and then to image it, you have to load it into a quantum gas microscope here, the way that they're doing it. And so that quantum gas microscope may not perfectly register with your tweezers, but there's still a one-to-one -one correspondence between tweezer and lattice site, so you know exactly where every atom was. So they actually, this gives us another way of getting colder. You can get, uh, start essentially with perfect zero entropy initial states and do adiabatic loading. I think this is very interesting. I just wanted to advertise some additional theory work and some theory work that connects to some things that again, I think may interest this community. Um, a challenge here is that we actually have to figure out what are the Hubbard parameters. If you give me a, whoops, if I give you a tweezer configuration, what are the on-site interactions on these tweezers and what are the tunnel couplings between the tweezers? Or if I have more bands, what are the interband interactions? For, so for an optical lattice, that's extremely easy. And the reason is, well, one reason is that most optical lattices are separable. So you can so turn a three-dimensional optical lattice into a kind of set of 1D problems. There are non-separable lattices, but even there, just due to the kind of length scales involved and the periodicity, it makes the problem pretty straightforward to solve, and people have done this for a long time. For these tweezer arrays where you don't have periodicity, you have to think how to, what are 
even the sort of wannier functions you use to build these parameters. And so for chemists, for materials scientists, they've understood how to do this for a few decades at least, um, and we stole all their methods and applied it to this system. And we can just, given its Weezer configuration, spit out all the parameters. And so all these numbers you're seeing here are the on-site U, the tunneling, and the on-site, uh, sorry, the on-site interaction, the tunneling, and the on-site potential, all in units of hertz. Um, and this runs in just a few minutes on a laptop for these kinds of things that I'm showing you here. So you can get the Hubbard parameters pretty easily. Where we'd really like to go with this is when somebody, when one of you says, here's a model I want to study. Go build a tweezer system to go study my favorite model. So you type in the Hubbard parameters, and you solve the inverse problem of what tweezer configuration would give those to you. And so this inverse problem, the only way we really know how to do it now is to sort of use, you know, uh, use a cost function of, uh, of given tweezer, so, so okay, sorry, let me restate this. You're given the tweezer configuration, you calculate the Hubbard parameters for that tweezer configuration, then you can just kind of run your favorite minimize over the set of the tweezer configurations of the cost function, which is the deviation of your target values from the values predicted by this program. Um, unfortunately, doing that in practice is not so easy at all. So for very simple like translation invariant cases or cases where we tweak things by hand, we can get it to work. But a sort of robust way of doing this optimization problem um, is, is still lacking and something we'd very much like to do. And so here's another case where I think it would be very cool to try some machine learning ideas. And I think there are a couple different ways to think about applying them. So one way, and this is actually something we've been collaborating with Lucas Wagner about, is to, um, try to improve the speed with which we can calculate these Hubbard parameters. Because we might be able to solve this optimization problem if we could quickly solve 100,000 or a mil, whoa, what? that's interesting. Um, sorry, it's advancing itself. So 100,000 or a million tweezer configurations and get the Hubbard parameters and invert everything. Um, unfortunately, we're still too slow to do that. So maybe if we can machine learn the sort of forward problem, we could use that to solve the inverse problem. Another way might be just to train a system on a bunch of forward problems, right? So you sort of have uh, labeled data, uh, configurations, and Hubbard parameters, and use this to try to learn a function from Hubbard parameters to uh, the tweezer configurations. And so I think this would be another very interesting challenge to try to apply machine learning to. Okay, but as I was saying here, this is not enough programmability for me, I want to be able to go even farther than this. But again, let me pause. Uh, are we all happy? Do we understand what's going on with these programmable tweezer arrays? Because I'm going to continue talking about these programmable tweezer arrays, but in a very different way of using them. OK. Good. Let's use them differently. So this still didn't give me long, this was great for geometry, but it didn't give me like long range interactions or gauge fields or few body interactions. So how could I engineer these things? And here we're taking inspiration from the um, quantum computing community. And we've heard about these sort of approaches, again, at this workshop, these variational quantum estimation algorithms, where we want to prepare a variational state, usually by running a quantum circuit, and then that gives us some onsat state. You have some parameters in this quantum circuit, which are your variational parameters. And so you go run your algorithm, calculate some expectation values by doing lots of shots and averaging. And then you feed that into a optimizer, just a, your classical computer runs the quantum computer to optimize these variational parameters. And you can find a good variational approximation potentially to your ground state. And the idea here is that a quantum computer can make more expressive onsatses than a classical computer can. And if those more expressive onsatses are actually good for the problem, then you have something that could potentially be a lot faster than any classical algorithm. And there's been a lot of work showing that in principle, at least if you can do the variational parameter optimization, which is a pretty big if, um, you can exponentially outperform classical algorithms with this in some cases. So we wanted to do the same thing but instead of running this on a quantum computer, what if we use these programmable fermionic tweezer arrays? So we would actually use the dynamics of a programmable tweezer array, the Hubbard model dynamics, to prepare a variational state. 
And now I have variational parameters like how long I ran the dynamics, the on-site potentials can vary during time. How do I tune those to get the best variational approximation to my, to my ground state of whatever target Hamiltonian I want to study? And I'm not limited to studying Hubbard models as my target Hamiltonian anymore, at least not the vanilla Hubbard model. Because I have to measure this energy of the target system. But when I'm measuring things in these programmable tweezers, I can measure the nearest neighbor correlator. Which means if I want, I can add a term into my target Hamiltonian that is like a nearest neighbor interaction, or a next nearest neighbor interaction. And I can add these up in a way that makes it look like a Coulomb interaction. So using this sort of hybrid analog digital approach, you can actually create variational states, then get the energy of that variational state in a target Hamiltonian that's like, say, a Coulomb interacting Hubbard model. Okay. So I think this is a very interesting idea for going beyond the sort of lattice models that we can simulate now. In fact, you can prove this is a fully universal quantum computer. Of course, you still have to think about getting fidelities good enough if you really want to go that direction. But in principle, anything you want to do, you can do. And so here are some nice results that we have from numerical simulations of this, where um, this is just a simple case where we're actually simulating a ground state of the ordinary Hubbard model using dynamics of a Hubbard model, which is maybe the stupidest one to do. We also have other results, but these are very clean and developed at this point. So this is what I'm showing you. This is the relative error in the ground state energy that's found as a function of the sort of time you run the experiment. Here it's the number of layers of Hubbard interaction that you apply to the system. And it, th notice this is a log scale. It decreases exponentially, which is very good. And then at some point, it actually decreases super exponentially. This is kind of an over-parameterized regime where you have more parameters than your Hilbert space or approaching a similar number to your Hilbert space. So you should never think about actually reaching into this over-parameterized regime for a useful sort of case. Um, but what's nice is these are different system sizes that I'm showing here, and the um, error doesn't really grow with the system size. So at some point, you're just uh, the only error is your variational state error, and you just get this nice exponential convergence. And this, so you're getting with a, with a linear amount of quantum computation or fermionic programmable tweezer uh, time, you get an exponentially decaying error which is not the case for most classical simulation algorithms. And we have results on this for nearest neighbor interacting Hubbard, I think Coulomb a Hubbard, attractive Hubbard, Hubbard with gauge fields, and uh, s some of them are a lot messier, but the same message seems to still apply everywhere we've looked. So very interested in, in doing this. And again, I think what gets swept under the rug with all the quantum computing algorithms of this flavor that we're basing this on is actually doing the optimization of the variational parameters. Um, I'm very hopeful this can be done, mainly because you can optimize so many classical variational ansatzes, but there are serious obstacles to doing this. And so there are at least some optimization ideas, if not machine learning ideas, that could help with this. Um, you can imagine training on small systems and using this to extrapolate to large systems, or training on short depth, where you can simulate on a classical computer and extrapolating to large depth. I think there are some really interesting problems there. Okay, so that's pretty good, and that's, this, is, this is sort of the end of everything I wanted to tell you about programmable fermions. I've shown you SUN gives you this cool tuning knob that has really pushed us past classical simulability, far past it. Uh, we're trying to understand that. Then these programmable tweezer arrays give you flexible geometries. They give you maybe more than flexible geometries if we use them in innovative ways. And uh, then to the last part of my talk, I was gonna tell you about a totally different type of tunability, and I think Five, ten, like ten minutes, including questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So basically, it doesn't. So if I fix the number of layers in my variational ansatz, you can see as I go n l equal uh, uh, four, six, eight, ten. I don't see the, oh, there's the two. Sorry, the two gets very accurate very quickly. So two is almost, you know, there is zero. Two, four, six, eight, ten. You see it, it doesn't really scale as you go six, eight, ten. It looks like it's converging to something. It may be growing like a logarithm or maybe square root of system size, but something really weak. Um, obviously, we haven't managed to push this to very large systems. Why not? You know, it's easy to simulate an N equal to L equal ten system, length ten. These are just 1D length ten chains. 
Um, we've also done some 2D systems. These are pretty easy to simulate, but to do the variational parameter optimization, you just have to run so many times that we haven't really pushed it yet. Um, we have some results not shown here for the Bose Hubbard model, where we push things a little bit further, and it does look like, you know, it's not asymptoting to a constant, but it's a very slow growth, whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> badly, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, uh, so the finite fidelity of, the, of your quantum system is a, is a serious question. And it could be, for example, that these tunneling operations are not nearly as coherent as a Rydberg operation. Um, and I actually forgot to mention one of the most important reasons for doing this, though, which will answer this question to some degree. Um, anytime you try to simulate fermions on an ordinary digital quantum computer, you have to map fermions to qubits. You have to map anti-commutations into commutation. And so this requires Jordan Wigner strings, or there are smarter ways to do it. Um, but even if you use the absolute best encodings, you're talking about factors of 20 overhead. So to implement something as simple as move a fermion from here to here in a square lattice, that's going to take something like 20 C naught gates. And so even if you have a 0.99 fidelity on your C naught gate, if you have to do 20 of them, now your fidelity is 85% or something like that. So in contrast, in the programmable tweezer array, you just tunnel. And so, um, so basically, uh, you can tolerate sort of, you can match a digital quantum computer by having 20 times worse fidelity on your operations and still get the same net fidelity. So I think it's bad. It's bad for both digital and this architecture. Um, but, but this architecture has this advantage. And this is why, you know, I think this is an architecture that as a quantum computing platform specifically for simulating um, fermionic systems is pretty interesting. So. All right. Should I move to synthetic dimensions then? I will. Yeah. Right, so getting, so, so, so this is the right question. So if you really, I, I'm not sure that this will be practical to go towards a full model of real material, not in the near term, you know, I can dream. So let me dream a little bit. So here's the dream, and I've written many unsuccessful proposals with this dream, so hopefully one will be successful, will progress. Some have been with Lucas. Um, and the idea is to take a real condensed matter material and we can pretty much engineer lots of spatial interactions. What is challenging for us is maybe engineering the higher bands in a way that works well. Um, and so you could mimic that by maybe doing two layers or something, but you know, it, it's challenging. So the idea is to try to use further classical computation and marry it with this approach. So there are these downfolding techniques in condensed matter where really the high orbital stuff that's not so challenging to treat because it's high energy. So classically, at least if you get high enough orbitals, the classical methods can kind of integrate out those degrees of freedom and give you a simplified model where all the real strong correlation hard stuff happens. So what I'd really love is to have this suite of sort of powerful downfolding classical techniques to map real material onto say a two band, three band model that you can then implement in the cold atom system. Yes? Uh-huh. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. That's a good question, I don't actually know. Um, so, so you definitely get the long range interactions. Um, there might also be ways to maybe eliminate that frequency dependent coupling. I think a lot of these downfolding schemes actually are trying to basically do that, find the best static in time Hamiltonian to do this for you. 
But, um, but to actually implement a retarded coupling, it's a very good question. With these sort of uh, variational VQE approaches, they can do dynamics using variational principles like uh, um, Dirac or McLaughlin or whatever these variational pr principles are. Um, and so maybe you could do something where you do like a mid-circuit measurement and based on that uh, do some reset and look at correlations. It's an interesting idea. I haven't thought about it at all. So. Yeah, it, it would be very cool to be able to implement retarded interactions using the system. Yeah. All right, so, um, so is it okay if I use the last few minutes to talk? So, uh, you know, I want to make sure you have time to ask your questions, but as I said, just interrupt me. So if I run out of time, I won't feel bad. I didn't give you time to ask questions. So I'm going to quickly just tell you about the last type of programmability. And this is a programmability that you're going to be a little skeptical when I first tell you about it. But it's t sort of taken over lots of systems. There's been lots of experimental work in different quantum platforms doing this. I'm just going to tell you about the uh, Rydberg atom and molecule realizations of this, which was something we suggested a few years ago. And I'll start by telling about one particle physics and then interacting physics. So what is a real lattice, not a synthetic lattice? What is a real lattice? It's a say, atom or electron moving through a periodic potential. That's one example, or just moving through space. In this cartoon, if I'm in a single band limit, there are four places that atom can sit. And so just drawing it a little bit differently, here are four sites that the atom can sit in. OK, now I look at a molecule. It has different rotational states. If I pick four of those rotational states, now the molecule has four places it can sit in. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the Hilbert spaces of these models. Don't roll your eyes too much yet. It's gonna, I think it's more interesting than this. So to make two quantum systems equivalent, you don't just need the same Hilbert space. You need the same Hamiltonian. So how do we get the same Hamiltonian? So if I have single particle physics, I have tunneling, say, between nearest neighbors or longer neighbors in the real space. To implement this in synthetic space, all you have to do is shine near resonant uh, microwaves in this case to drive transitions between your rotational levels. And then within the rotating wave approximation, which is highly accurate, one part in a thousand, even better, um, you have totally the same Hamiltonian. And now the brilliant thing is that experimentalists can apply lots of these microwaves for rotational states of molecules or for Rydberg atom levels. They are not equally spaced. So each transition gets its own transition frequency. And you can drive them all independently. And thanks to the military and cell phone companies, generating millions of microwaves or something is not so hard. You know? um, so you can just take something. This is a slightly better uh, indication of what a molecular rotational spectrum looks like. Please pretend these are not actually degenerate like I drew them. You can do that by turning on a magnetic field or electric field. Notice that if I couple this set of states, I will get a nice 1D chain. Things do not leak out of this chain. If I couple a pair of these chains next to each other, I get a ladder, a two by n system. And I, I can just program in on my favorite, you know, however you control these experiments. And at just one millisecond, you're doing this. Uh, geometry, the next millisecond you're doing another geometry. You just change the microwaves. I can do periodic boundary conditions. Not a lot of experiments can do that. I can put a gauge field through my periodic boundary conditions by changing the phase of my microwaves. So a lot of flexibility. You know, this is just kind of being pedantic about all the flexibility. You can do on-site potentials and you get free quantum gas microscope imaging where you can image every level, sort of. Um, let me get away with that if you don't mind. So um, just in the interest of time, I only have a couple minutes. So I'm just going to say uh, the first demonstration of this, we proposed this back in, I think, 2018, 2019. My colleague Tom Killian at Rice, um, we wrote this nice paper where his group and Barry Dunning had demonstrated using this with Rydberg atoms to actually realize a topological band structure. And for them, topological and non-topological, it's all the same because you just type in whatever band structure you want using your microwaves. And they were able to see the topological edge states. They are able to turn on perturbations that break the edge states by breaking the symmetry that preserves, protects the topology, or able to see that you could turn on disorder that was in the symmetry class of the topological band structure, did not perturb the um, edge states. Okay. So it all worked beautifully, worked like absolutely as well as you can imagine. They now have a couple papers that are pushing this idea further. Um, only last thing I wanted to say is that where I find this more interesting is to combine it with interactions. Because single particle physics, well, we could understand single particle physics. Um, but interaction physics, we quickly get into difficult to simulate things. And so we use the natural dipole-dipole interaction 
And this has now been demonstrated experimentally by Bryce Gadway and Jake Covey. Uh, and they actually do exactly what I suggested. Again, using Rydberg atoms, they can apply a gauge field onto these four sites. They use a four site synthetic dimension with the level scheme here. And they can, by putting these in tweezers, looking at the dipole interactions, look at how that affects the dynamics. So I will not tell you about that, but here's single particle dynamics. There's different gauge fields. Here's how the interactions modify things. And we have this new platform that is completely programmable in the synthetic space and also has this programmability in real space of the tweezers. So I think that's a good place for me to stop and conclude. We've been trying to understand the physics of those systems, which is really rich. Also look at it in molecules. Where's my conclusions? There we go. Um, collaborators, conclusions. Um, I can flip back to the collaborators if you want to stare at them. So we have all of this programmable matter, real space, synthetic space, totally new frontier, lots of interesting questions, lots of ideas to apply machine learning to it. And uh, I think I'll just leave you with those pictures to think about and take any questions if there's in the negative one minute we have here. So. OK, thank you. I think uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah. So they, oh. Good. Okay, so uh, thank you, Hazard. Let's thank the speaker again. Our, well, 